So the next topic is cost-benefit analysis, and you guys are probably familiar with this um, for making other kinds of decisions, but it can be used for making um, decisions about how we value ecosystem services as well. Um, and basically, the environmental and economic impact assessments are used to evaluate different projects and decide which one um, is going to work best. Um, such reviews are a type of cost-benefit analysis where they look at all the potential costs and benefits. All the externalities are taken into account to determine if a project is appropriate. And so basically they look at all the costs and benefits, whether they're included in the market price or not, to make um, a decision about what the best action to take is. And this is a really good way to consider policies because um, government policies should be looking at what is going to have the most positive outcome for society in general. And so um, valuing ecosystem services and that sort of value is going to be important for society as a whole. Um, so this is an example um, from the Philippines where they did a cost-benefit analysis and they looked at the amount of revenue um, under different um, options for tourism, fisheries, and logging. Um, and so they wanted to know what to do um, to develop and how they were going to um, have the most revenue overall um, for the community. So option one here you can see is intensive logging until timber is depleted. And for this, the revenue for tourism would be the lowest at $6 million. Fisheries would be depleted somewhat, um, and there would be revenue of $9 million, but we'd get um, more um, income from logging, so $10 million. So the total comes out to 25. And then you can see they looked at option two, where they um, banned logging and put in a protected area. Um, and you can see that the tourism dollars are the highest with this option. Um, fisheries is higher, but you get no money from logging. And the total revenue for that is $42 million. And then you can look also at sustainable logging where um, some trees are taken out so that there's some profit um, in all of the sectors. So you get um, a little bit less money for tourism than with the protected area and a little bit less for fisheries, but you still get some income from logging. And this actually comes out to $44 million, which you can see is the highest. The, um, they ultimately decided to go with option two, which does have a little bit less total revenue, um, but they thought it would be very difficult to regulate sustainable logging. They thought it would be easier just to say, hey, I see someone logging, that's not allowed. Um, so that's what they ended up choosing, but they did use this um, as a way to make their decision. Um, and cost-benefit analyses can be really difficult to calculate. Um, an example here, if you did a cost-benefit analysis for a proposed paper mill, um, to do this, you would have to estimate the future price of paper, the need for clean water, and the value of the species that live in the forest that's going to be harvested. And it's difficult to decide what um, to use as an estimate for um, things in the future. It's also difficult to put a monetary value on the need for clean water, for example. Um, because of this difficulty, it's really common for these analyses to undervalue um, some of the costs. Um, and governments and agencies will often apply the precautionary principle, which is something we use in lots of disciplines. Um, but the idea is that it's easier or better to err on the side of caution um, rather than have costs that may outweigh weigh the benefits. And it's a form of risk management. It's basically being careful. Um, when you put on your seat belts, when you drive in your car, when you put on your helmet, when you ride your bike, that's kind of applying the precautionary principle. Most of the time, you're not going to get in a wreck in your car and you're not going to wreck your bike. Um, but it's better to be safe because if those things did happen, you'd be much better off if you wore your helmet and your seat belt than if you didn't. So accounting for externalities, um, this cost-benefit analysis, this type of them, requires internalization of all the externalities. So any kind of damage to ecosystem services that um, have value um, need to be included in the cost-benefit analysis. Um, and so sometimes environmentally damaging industries can appear profitable even though they're not 
because they're heavily subsidized for governments or by governments, excuse me. Um, and these are called perverse subsidies. They're perverse because they subsidize something um, that's actually harmful rather than something that's good. So examples of this might be if there is a subsidy um, to make uh, mining more um, attractive in an area to attract mining companies, um, but if the mining companies aren't required to clean up their waste, um, it might be damaging the clean water in the area. And so that'd be a perverse subsidy because the government is encouraging something um, that may actually be damaging to the people in that area. Because if there are contaminants in the water, lots of people um, could be harmed and have poor health outcomes. So that's a perverse subsidy. Um, if the subsidies are removed, then the damage from these industries would be reduced. So if the government hadn't subsidized the mining industry in this example, then um, in general, people would be better off. Um, when we do cost-benefit analyses, we have to um, often estimate the value of resources in the future, and that's really difficult. And usually... Um, economists will give a lower value to resources in the future than they do for resources in the present. Can you think of why they might do that? So there's a couple of reasons. One, people always um, prefer to have money now rather than later. Um, two, you could take that money now and invest it and potentially have greater returns in the future than if you waited to get the money in the future, you're missing out on that interest that you could have been getting. Um, so it basically assumes that resources have greater value now than they will in the future. Um, so why do this? I just gave you a couple of reasons. Another reason is inflation. So a dollar today is often worth more in the future because of inflation. Um, I talked about investment. Um, Long-term benefits can also be uncertain. Um, so we can estimate how much a resource will be worth in the future, but we don't really know. So a lot of economists think it's safer to discount that because since we have uncertainty about the future, but we know what the price is now. Um, but ultimately, this discounting affects how we value economic resources. Um, and I want to give you an example. Um, country was trying to decide about um, establishing a national marine sanctuary. Um, so what do you guys think some of the benefits and costs might be to ha putting a national marine sanctuary in place? And you can pause the video to come up to kind of brainstorm about what you think. So some of the things that other people have come up with include um, tourism. So a marine sanctuary, if it's especially where a coral reef is, there could be tourism dollars for people wanting to go snorkeling or scuba diving. Um, it'll save some fish for the future so that we can keep fishing into um, the future. There's recreation. Costs might include equipment upgrades, um, no fishing in that particular area for right now, and lost production um, in terms of uh, fishing for the near term at least. So this is where they did that. Um, they did benefits and costs um, and they looked at tourism, fishing, seafood, um, and recreation dollars. Um, and you can see that they didn't allow fishing for the first seven years. That's why there's no um, revenue from fishing in years one through seven. Um, and you can see the cost. And basically what they needed to do is figure out how to discount the future. So they looked at three different discount rates, um, a 3% discount rate, a 7% discount rate, and a 10% discount rate. And you can see that the values are really different between the benefits and the costs. So we can see here, if you use a 10% discount rate, the benefits, the cost benefits of the marine sanctuary are actually lower than... Um, the costs, which tells us that we probably shouldn't do it. If you go to a 7% discount rate, then um, it's still a little bit lower, the benefits, than the costs. Um, and so you can see the benefit to cost ratio here. If it's 1, that means that the benefits and the costs um, are identical. But if it's less than 1, it means that the costs are greater than the benefits. And if it's more than 1, and we only get more than 1 when we only discount the future by 3%. 
Um, and so making this decision affects the answer that you get when you do cost-benefit analyses. So it's important to think about how much resources in the future are worth relative to what they're worth right now, because that will really affect um, the outcome of these cost-benefit analyses. So you're trying to establish whether um, benefits are greater than costs, and somebody has to make a decision here, like are we going to make a national marine sanctuary or not? Um, and so somebody has to make this decision. So natural resource loss, um, ignored costs, these negative externalities that we've been talking about, can offset direct economic gains. Um, and some examples include the value of forest loss to logging in Costa Rica in the 1980s was much greater than the revenue from harvest those harvesting um, operations. Um, and Costa Rica now has a very um, progressive, um, very environmentally friendly um, set of government regulations um, because they get so much money from um, tourism um, and people come, it's a destination that people come to, um, to see the rainforest, to go snorkeling, um, and it brings in money from all over the world. Um, and so they've really tried to take advantage of that um, recently to make sure that they don't lose this value again. And so we can see here that sometimes we make decisions that are good in the short term, but may be um, not good in the long term. And sometimes those result in the depletion of our natural resources. Um, so another example here is ignored costs around England's agricultural industry amount to about $2.6 billion, which is about 9% of the value of the country's agriculture. Um, and so if they manage their agriculture better, they would have more value as a whole to society. Um, oil spills are a big one. Um, I want to give you this example. Um, in 18, yeah, I cannot talk right now, sorry. Um, in 1989, the Exxon Valdez um, oil spill was a huge environmental disaster in southern Alaska. We're all familiar with the oil spill in the Gulf that was more recent. Um, but this was huge. This is one of the biggest headlines of the late 1980s was this gigantic oil spill um, in southern Alaska. It wasted... 11 million gallons of oil, it killed many, many animals, damaged the environment, it cost billions of dollars to clean up. They're still cleaning it up, amazingly enough, even though it happened in 1989. But what's interesting is all the spending that occurred to work on cleaning up the oil spill actually increased the GDP. Um, and so our economy got bigger because we put so much money into this cleanup effort. So this is an illustration of how sometimes our values that measure economic growth don't line up with total value to society. Because the damage that was done um, to fisheries, um, to the environment, uh, to potentially to people's health from this oil spill, not to mention the amount of oil that was just wasted, um, those were huge losses to society, yet our economy showed that it was growing because we spent a lot of money to work on cleaning up the oil spill. Um, so this is the kind of negative externalities that sometimes we get, and um, this shows how sometimes um, the values that we have for the environment don't match up with how uh, we measure the growth of our economy.